discussion of discussion of the pact we made uh, to its author, um, who's speaking about uh, not speaking about uh, Gulf women's literature as it happens today. So Leila Alama, who possibly needs no introduction to many of you, um, who's at Lancaster. And Leila's title um, today is perhaps I was a Lebanese Hamlet, Uncanny Modernity and the Ontological Unbeing of the Modern Arab Male in Radar Saman's The Square Moon. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, and thank you, Alice, for that. It's always odd as, as a scholar, watching a scholar <laughs> discussing your creative work, but um, I'm sure speaking for Shahed and myself, we, we appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, uncanny modernity, as Lindsay said, and the ontological unbeing in Rade Samant, the square moon. Um, to give you a little bit of a background on this text, it's uh, a collection of short stories, 10 short stories, published in 1994, translated to English in 98. And here someone uses the fantasy genre, which is kind of par for the course for a lot of her fiction, um, but it's a, it's a kind of surreal quasi-Gothic application of fantasy, and it conveys the haunting estrangement afflicting her Lebanese uh, immigrants who have fled the civil war, seeking refuge in Paris and New York. I argue that this diasporic setting allows someone to gesture to what is uncanny in Arab modernity itself, and thus reveals the uh, trauma in the character's very constitution. So, uh, Samman's use of fantasy here really embodies um, Ursula Le Guin's definition as a journey to self-knowledge, speaking to the unconscious, from the unconscious, in the language of the unconscious. And so, to talk about the unconscious automatically takes us to Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, and in his beautiful little 1919 essay on the uncanny, he describes the unheimlich or the uncanny as a phenomena where that which is familiar is encountered as strange and frightening. The uncanny provokes a sense of fear, which he attributes to returned repressions of infantile complexes or confrontations with animistic beliefs thought to have been abandoned, but which suddenly manifest in reality. For him, the, uh, the uncanny can manifest in a number of ways, uh, including sorcery, divisions of the self, the omnipotence of thoughts, the prompt fulfillment of wishes, um, sorry, just lost my secret injurious powers, and the return of the dead. So uh, for my talk today, I'm going to be focusing on the first story in Rada's um, collection, which is called Beheading the Cat, and I'm looking at it through a, a kind of Freudo-Lacanian lens, so still utilizing Freud's uncanny, his uh, theories on hysteria, on melancholia, which I believe still uh, offer us very illuminating hermeneutic pathways for looking at Arab literature. But I'm also going to be incorporating Lacan's theory of orders, so the symbolic, the imaginary, and the real which I think offer us a materialist, relational way of thinking about subjectivity and the constitution of the subject, which, which I think is more in line with the social material realities um, that we face in many Arabic speaking societies. So in Beheading the Cat, our protagonist is Abdul. He's a 35 year old man. He has a PhD in French literature. He's a self-confessed Cartesian, a you know, a rationalist person. He's been living in Paris for 10 years, having uh, fled Lebanon with his parents uh, during the Civil War. And when the story opens, he's contemplating marriage to Nadine, who is 20 and unlike him was raised in Paris. So Nadine is a very strong, highly intelligent character. She's full of action and conviction, whether verbal, sexual, or physical. And when Abdul uh, questions her Lebaneseness in light of these attributes, which are counter to his memories of women back home, she says, I'm a woman who is modern, realistic, free, independent in love and Lebanese. 
If I have the right to combine all these qualities with my Lebanese identity, then I am Lebanese. And she frequently challenges his expectations of a wife and goes some distance towards um, marking the difference between herself and women of their mother's generation. And she says, I don't wanna be an employee of my husband. I too have my work, my world, my torments, my thoughts. You are part of my life, not the center of it. Marriage is no longer a part of a man's life and the end of a woman's. And so really uh, Abdul's dilemma in this uh, story is to marry or not to marry Nadine. And he hesitates because quote, what attracts me to her is the same thing that makes me afraid of her. Quite simply, he cannot conceive of the kind of equality that Nadine demands. So where she views marriage and love as a partnership built on equality and honesty, he sees a battlefield where one is either the dominant or the dominated. Yes. So uh, really the uncanny manifests in the story in two main ways. The first way is through this matchmaker who shows up at the door one day to the apartment that Abdul shares with his parents. And uh, initially he thinks that she's a friend of his mother's from, from Beirut because she reminds him of the women of Beirut and the way that she talks, the way that she dresses. But as she moves through the home, she brings these kinds of uh, uncanny occurrences where she doesn't leave an indent on the cushion when she sits, her reflection doesn't show in the mirror, she leaves no tracks on the floor. And so she, she has these kinds of spectral qualities about her, even though uh, Abdul uh, dismisses this as superstition. But she sits down and she extols the virtues of the perfect bride, the kind of ideal bride that he should want, saying that she's quiet and obedient. She'll never leave home without asking your permission, unless it's to her grave. She'll give birth only to boys, a maid by day, a slave girl by night. And as she goes on with these traits, it begins to trigger these repressed, what I call repressed unconscious wants that Abdul has been um, veiling with this professed desire to be modern. Uh, the matchmaker's words trigger um, these, these wants in him. And he remembers an adolescent dream of a wedding night where he would sign his name in the blood of his bride's wound on a white cloth, indicating there was yet another virgin of the tribe who has been deflowered in accordance with ancestral tradition. And obviously for those of you who are familiar with Arab literature, um, you'll recognize this, quote, uh, this trope. It's a very common trope um, in, in Arab fiction. The other manifestation of the uncanny, I argue, comes with Abdul's split self. So the matchmaker calls him Abdul Razak, his full Arabic name. Whereas since moving to Paris, he has shortened it or westernized it to Abdul. But the matchmaker calls him Abdul Razak. And scholars who have looked at the story have seen this as a kind of classic case of an East-West encounter, right? So it's this kind of psychic trauma of a subject who has moved into a Western, here Parisian ideology, which has come into conflict with their Eastern, Arab, here Lebanese ideology. And that the clash between these two is what is giving rise to his split self. I would argue, however, that that's not the case, that what we're seeing here, in fact, is an East, modern East conflict. So it's the struggle of, a, of, of an Arab male who's realizing that uh, the ideology of home is not only insufficient for this new place that he finds himself in, but it's insufficient for this time that he finds himself in. So, as the matchmaker keeps talking and Abdul keeps thinking about Nadine, he says that he feels emasculated by the vigor of Nadine and her tyrannical human presence. And he frequently juxtaposes her athletic body with his weaker frame. And so we can see from this clinging to oppositional heteronormative gender binaries that the symbolic order of home lacks a signifier for the type of man Abdul desires to be. And so uh, a process of alienation begins where Nadia Borali says in a separate context, 
the subject appears precisely as a non-being or in the place of a lack of being. And so what we're seeing here, I would argue, is that Abdul's struggle is actually the struggle of an Arab male trying to fashion himself into a modern Arab male, an entity for which he has no signifier because there is as yet no symbolic order to constitute him. So what do I mean by symbolic order? I keep saying symbolic order. And this brings us to Lacan, uh, Jacques Lacan, a French psychoanalyst who's quite famous for his return to Freud and his reformulation of Freud's ideas. And so he comes up with these three orders, the symbolic, imaginary, and the real, which are involved in subject formation. And in 1953, he conceptualizes the symbolic order as a dimension of language that structures the individual's unconscious and thus becomes a determinant of subjectivity. So he says the unconscious is the sum of the effects of speech on a subject at the level at which the subject constitutes himself out of the effects of the signifier. And this leads him to perhaps his most well-known statement, the unconscious is structured like a language. So what does this mean? It kind of removes us from Freud's conceptualization of the unconscious as a kind of substantive entity, this, um, this thing that is sort of created in a vacuum and is not really governed by external frameworks or determinants. And Lacan's idea of the symbolic order moves us into, like I said before, a more relational idea of how the individual constitutes their subjectivity. And, and it's more materialist because he, in a sense, says that there's a framework that exists and predates the subject and that your um, subjectivity is constituted by your insertion into this order that predates you. And so Celia Britton gives a, a really, what I think is a clear definition of the symbolic, um, certainly clearer than Lacan could ever hope for. If you've read Lacan, he's quite dense uh, in terms of his prose. But Celia Britton says that the symbolic is the pre-existing trans-individual matrix of signification on which man is fundamentally dependent. It governs all forms of social organization and intervenes as a mediating third term in all relations between individuals. And so returning to Freud's Oedipus complex, Lacan saw the father as representing the other, this wider world of law and signifiers that predates and constitutes the subject. And he says, we depend on the field of the other, which was there long before we came into the world and whose circulating structures determine us as subjects. So what does it mean for our Arabic speaking societies? Logic dictates that what Lacan calls a symbolic order is in fact many symbolic orders and whichever order you happen to be born into is the one which ultimately uh, determines or constitutes your subjectivity. And I, I would agree with Alice that I think that uh, uh, a, a good way of thinking about modern Arabic speaking societies is through the lens of, ne of Hisham Sharabi's theory of the neo-patriarchy which he sees as a kind of marriage of imperialism and patriarchy. And he says that whatever the outward modern forms of the contemporary neo-patriarchal family and society, their internal structures remain rooted in the patriarchal values and social relations of kinship and clan. This results in a schizophrenic modernity where beneath the immediately encountered modern appearance, there exists another latent reality. Between these two, there is opposition, tension, contradiction. And so I think that this tension is perfectly um, epitomized or illustrated in this uh, struggle between the matchmaker and Nadine. The matchmaker, of course, representing these unconscious wants of the old symbolic order that constitutes Abdul versus Nadine, who represents these professed modern desires. And through Abdul's hesitation, we can see that he is revealed as a person who merely believes or as a man who merely believes in modernity, which is a condition uh, in Borali's words, which can easily give way to a form of superficial mim mimesis, one in which the essence of modernity goes unrealized. This essence being the transformation of habits, a subjective reconstitution necessitated by the modern drive for progress. And so my argument here is that the uncanny presence of the matchmaker who, when we get to the end of the story, 
is revealed to actually be the ghost of Abdul's aunt Badria, who passed away when he was a child and who very much embodied these kinds of cultural traditions of, of Lebanon. And so I argue that the uncanny presence of this matchmaker coupled with Nadine's pragmatic questions brings to the surface the unconscious wants constituted by his symbolic order, which Abdul has repressed and veiled over with his professed desire to be modern. What does this have to do with Hamlet? Um, the title of, of my talk is Perhaps I Was a Lebanese Hamlet. And there's this beautiful scene in the story that I think per perfectly kind of encapsulates the thesis of the story, but also the thesis of the collection as a whole in many ways. So as the matchmaker continues to describe the ideal bride, um, at one point she says, uh, an illiterate 14 year old good for a lifetime's marriage. Um, Abdul remembers this bungee jumping outing that he took with Nadine and her friends. And when he hesitates, Nadine holds him down while her friends bind his feet. And he says he is overwhelmed by a secret terror. Nadine in the spirit of partnership and equality offers to jump together, but he demurs saying to jump or not to jump, that is the question. She calls him a Lebanese Hamlet and flings herself off the bridge with a shout of liberté, freedom. Um, and so, you know, we would, we would be tempted to think of, of this allusion to Hamlet or this allusion to Hamlet to be about Abdul's endless musings, his refusal to act. Um, you know, this is kind of a central theme in Hamlet is that he refuses to act. Um, and this kind of accords with the way Freud describes Hamlet as the type of man whose active energy is paralyzed by excessive intellectual activity. But I would argue that there's a different way to look at this. And if we think about Abdul, um, like I said, a PhD in French literature, a self-confessed Cartesian, a rationalist. If we think of him as an intellectual, um, the kind of Gramscian intellectual as we think of them, then we can look at him through how C.L.R. James sees Hamlet as the original intellectual, where he says that in this play, Shakespeare had isolated and pinned down the psychological streak, which characterized the communal change from the medieval world to the world of free individualization, which gave birth to an inseparable tension between individual freedom and social responsibility. The result of this tension was the man for whom freedom of thought and spe speculation became a specialized function, the intellectual. And so my argument is that if we look at Abdul as an avatar for the modern Arab male, we can see that he illustrates what James says is a polarization of action and thought and social function and personality, leading to a sense of isolation, of impotence, of melancholy, with an ever-growing consciousness of the divorce between the boundless exhilaration of thought and reality. This melancholy, I would argue, may be one which in Agambenian terms represents an intention to mourn that precedes and anticipates the loss of the object. The object whose loss is anticipated here and forever deferred is the privilege and status enjoyed by the Arab male in their neo-patriarchal home societies. Yeah, <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, so what we have here is that Abdul is forced to confront his desire to be a modern Arab male as it is constituted by the other, uh, personified in the thoroughly modern Arabness of Nadine and which reflects back to him his own lack. This lack, if we go back and think about the bungee jumping scene that I mentioned, at one point he says, I was afraid, a man and afraid. I could not jump into empty space that way. This empty space that he can't jump into is not just the chasm off of the bridge. It is that lack within himself that he cannot bridge. That unbridgeable gap marked by melancholic anxiety and inertia, which I argue parallels the space of futility between the modern Arab male as a theory and the modern Arab male as a praxis. So where the, the modern Arab male can accept these demands of uh, progress and modernity and equality at a kind of intellectual abstract level, there's a difficulty in application 
and actually putting this theory into practice in your home with your loved ones, um, with the woman that you would hope to share a life with. And so at the end of the story, Abdul still can't decide whether he's going to propose to Nadine or not. And he says, perhaps I was a Lebanese Hamlet. I knew all the possibilities and studied matters from all angles, but knew nothing except that time was passing, the world was changing, and I was at a loss. Thank you. And I think I'm under time, Lindsay, if you can believe Fantastic. it. Fantastic. The timekeeping has been really good, actually, I have to say, in this panel. Um, we will give another five minutes for questions, I think. So we'll go through to 11.50 UK time, um, which gives us, I think, 13 minutes for questions. And then we'll break for a, a quick coffee um, before the book spotlight event. So I just want to thank again our three speakers. Um, for a really fascinating panel. I mean, the way that that moved between um, sort of intersectional specificities in terms of this de-invisibilization that, that's going on in contemporary literature um, and, and modern literature, um, the sort of the amount of things that were, were discussed there, not only gender, but disability, other forms of kind of stigmatized experience. Um, and then sort of moving between these, these kinds of um, you know, very intricate specificities and that underlying kind of cultural structural feeling that, that Leila has identified um, in the final paper. Um, so I have a question, um, but we, I think, have a question from Faisal. Is that right, Faisal? Would you like to come in and ask a quick question? I don't have time to read your whole comment out. Faisal, do you want to come on the mic? If not, I should try and gloss it. Okay. Um, writers and theorists, um, including Leila, um, are utilizing trauma theory, I think, to um, liberate particular kind of narrative subjects. Um, Faisal thinks we cannot keep approaching literary works by minorities with an unquestioned use of canonical trauma. Oh, okay. So I think you're wanting to ask uh, perhaps Leila specifically, but maybe our three speakers about um, the kinds of critical tools that they use. And if there is a risk in using theory, critical paradigms, which we might call Western. Would anybody like to respond to that question? Reinterpretations um, of trauma theory, I think <laughs> are what Faisal is, is calling for. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we have to keep in mind that this is all a kind of new ground that we're covering. Uh, literary trauma theory starts really in the mid 90s. The call to decolonize doesn't come until sometime in the mid 2000s. Uh, and that call to decolonize really focused or turned its attention quite quickly to um, narratives that deal with the legacies of slavery, racial oppression. Uh, so for, we saw a lot of Caribbean narratives, South Africa and apartheid. Um, this was kind of where the decolonizing focus immediately turned. Arab literature has been ignored for a number of reasons. Um, I, I argue in my thesis that a lot of that has to do with the wider neglect or the neglect of Middle Eastern literatures more generally in post-colonial studies, um, where the contexts are kind of too varied and the language is, you know, in the words of Edward Said, too controversial or too demanding um, to kind of fit into existing post-colonial paradigms. And so, you know, if you think about that neglect as a, as a pattern, literary trauma theory has also picked up that neglect and kind of incorporated it. Um, in the Palestinian case, we, we also can't neglect um, the huge influence of Holocaust studies and kind of quickly grabbing on to trauma theory and, and disseminating it through Holocaust studies and, and you know, memoirs and narratives um, um, of the Holocaust and Holocaust survivors. So I think that there's a lot of room for us to operate in terms of Arab literature in um, expanding and problematizing and extending literary trauma theory. I, I obviously don't think that we need to completely negate the foundations that the field was built on. My thesis works primarily with Freud, 
Um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm a lover of Freud, and I, and I think that he still has a lot to offer us. Um, but there are, are, there are interesting ways to work um, from that and to, to, to explore beyond that. Um, I'm currently reading Robert Cabe Shara's book on Freud and Said. It's a kind of contrapuntal uh, liberation practice. And it's a very interesting take on Freud and Said. You mentioned Faisal Rosemary Said, who, who talks about the neglect of, of Palestinian literature in the field. So I think that there, there is a lot for us to do and there, there, there are a lot of different fruitful avenues for us to explore um, with Arab literature in particular through a, a trauma theory lens. Um, Alice or Emanuela, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I think uh, if I understood the question correctly, because I think it's a very broad, very general, maybe comment more than a question, but I think uh, trauma studies can be very interestingly recontextualized within other kinds of theories. So uh, Laila was mentioning post-colonialism, or uh, as I used in my uh, theoretical lens, um, decolonization studies, for instance. And what I'm trying to do, for instance, is to bring theories that are geographically um, not dealing with the Middle East or with the Gulf in particular, but because they are so universal that they go beyond uh, the scope of the geographical uh, provenance of the people who um, elaborated them and also uh, the geographical uh, limitations that we could see, um, for instance, in the border between Mexico and the United States, which is a border that becomes a symbol of so many different uh, kinds of borders. And I think that there are um, issues that are really transversal, like gender, like uh, the impact of memory in trauma, and trauma in memory. So I think uh, trauma studies per se can be recontextualized uh, using multiple different theories, um, not, to be, uh, not to become uh, an academic uh, ghetto, I would say, uh, as some other theories have become. So expanding on it, as Lila was saying, and uh, again, I would say recontextualizing and reworking on that. Thank you. Yeah, I would just very quickly add something, although I think Leila and Emanuela put it uh, beautifully. So I'm kind of newer to the to uh, trauma studies. This is like the first time I ever dealt with it, but I thought it was so fitting. So that's why, um, yeah, I chose to, to pursue that a bit further. Um, yeah, I agree with the recontextualization. However, um, I mean, I usually I, I try to I try to incorporate um, theories from local uh, scholars if they are available. However, how Leila said, since this is so new, or like the studies are rather new, it's a bit uh, more difficult to find. However, I mean, I, I agree with Faisal that we should also always take into account the regional approach. And I do try to do that also within my PhD in other contexts. So yeah, that would be my take on that. Thank you. Fantastic. And you may have seen in the chat, everyone, that um, Leila and Roxanne Douglas are actually um, co-editing a, is it a, a special issue or a book? A special issue, I think, on- um, Special issue, yeah special issue, uh, recalibrating trauma theory in the context of Arab women's writing. So there's a call for papers. Um, the link is in the chat. Um, anyone particularly interested in this area, get your, your abstracts in, people. I see Faisal has, has already gone in. Um, I have a question for the three of you about, um, I mean, this is quite a broad question. I'm thinking about uh, I guess my question was prompted by you, Emanuela, saying that you're a sociologist who, who comes to literature for, for particular things. And I was wondering if you have, a, if any of you can comment on the tension, I think, which persists between acts of representing, you know, representing minority voices or kind of multiply marginalized voices on the one hand, and then the imperatives of literary creativity on the other, you know, what Said called virtuosity. Um, 
Layla in particular, I think, drew our attention to aspects of kind of genre and style. Um, do you have anything to say about this, the kind of relationship between representing socially and, and representing in a kind of creative sense? I mean, I think, I think the tension between those two always exists. And especially when you're talking about trauma, um, we have the ethics of representation, um, who gets to speak about trauma is uh, very much alive <laughs> as a question in the literary world. Um, and so I think that these are considerations that definitely need to be taken uh, to heart and taken very seriously. I don't know that I have an answer um, I don't know that I've settled on an answer. I will say that, you know, for Arab literature in particular, there's always been a blurring of that line where the literature is a reflection of our social reality. It is a way of giving shape and form and voice to the social consciousness, to the movements. Um, that's always kind of been accepted and, and, and writers have always felt obliged or duty bound to reflect their realities rather than just uh, art for art's sake. Uh, so there is, there is a complicated relationship uh, made more complicated, I guess, by, like I said, these discussions that we're having now about the ethics of who gets to speak about trauma. I, I don't know, I don't have an answer <laughs> either as an academic or as a writer. But the perhaps differing role of the author as perceived or the importance of the author in Arab societies is, is something that's relevant um, to the topic. Yeah, Alice or Emanuela, did you have anything to, to add to this? Well, I, what I think in that is interesting in that context, because I remember that Leila, you also, when you wrote uh, Silence is a Sense, that you actually received some well, let's say criticism, because you were speaking on some, you know, on a Syrian behalf, although you're a Kuwaiti writer, right? So that kind of reminds me a little bit about representation and who speaks for whom. And I think that especially in creative writing, you should have the liberty of, you know, giving marginalized, um, marginalized um, people and characters a voice. Because maybe you have a voice. Why don't you give it to, you know, two people on the margins? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Leila would like to comment on that any further because I find that super interesting. Um, so I'm kind of redirecting the question to you. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know. I mean, that's a question that I just got asked over the weekend when I, I dropped in on a uh, Debiat book club. Uh, but the, I mean, that, that question of who gets to write about certain subjectivities it's like, how, how narrow and tight are you going to make the box? I mean, uh, to say that you have to be a Syrian and a refugee in order to write a novel about a Syrian refugee, uh, it's a bizarre question, I think, to ask of mm -hmm. a novelist. And I don't recall anyone asking Colin McCann, if he, <laughs> who was neither Palestinian nor Israeli, why he felt he should write a novel about those two subjectivities. It's a very bizarre right. question. It's a question that tends to get asked of women a lot more frequently than it gets asked of men. Mm. Um, but I think that that, that that comes back to the role of literature, fiction, I should say, and what a fiction writer's job is. That's not to say that we shouldn't approach these stories ethically and responsibly and sensitively, um, but you know, where are you going to draw the line? If all of us are only going to write about our own personal stories, none of us is going to write more than one book. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. But would you then also say that this is more specifically to Arab women writers in particular? I mean, if you're asking whether I would have been comfortable with a non-Arab writing about a Syrian refugee, I'm not in a position or I don't believe that we should be policing fiction at all. I mean, mm. you, you, fiction writers are free to write whatever they want. Now, I, as an Arab woman, can come out and say that there are specific things wrong with what you're doing or how you approached this story. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm not in a position of policing novelists. I don't, I don't think that's, that's something that we should get into. Yeah, I, I agree feel, with that. I feel this is an issue we're going to return to again and again. So it is, <laughs> uh, we have a, a short gap now. Feel free to stay, chat to each other in the chat or indeed via the camera and the mic. Um, but we're officially going to have a quick break now for 10 minutes.
Um, so can I thank again our wonderful panelists, Emanuela, Alice and Leila for three really thought